With the base of ontological dualism, paganism sits amongst other spiritual belief systems, including, though not limited to, Taoism and Hinduism. In traditional paganism or Wicca, the balance and cyclical nature inherent in the wheel of the year is woven into a sort of equilibrium between a god and a goddess. Mind you, not every modern pagan practices with reverence to the god and goddess. Each path is unique and tailored to the individual practitioner. In fact, the only rule in Wicca is more of a guideline involving mason jars. The goddess is often spoken about, both by practitioners and those interested in the belief system. The god, however, is sometimes spoken about in hushed tones. I am not quite sure why, but find myself eager to share my perception of that particular deity in the hopes that a more clear description and explanation may lift a veil of misunderstanding some may hold. I shall begin by stating clearly that the horn god is one of the two most revered figures in paganism. He is the equal to and the balance of the goddess. However, he is not the first horn deity tucked into the histories, history of past ages. Throughout nearly every past civilization, there has been a deity or angelic being of some sort with horns. These figures have been both male and female. Let's take a closer look at these differing incarnations across time. Experts have traced horned deities back to Mesopotamia, long believed to be the first civilization that maintained a method of record keeping. Author Ger Kaplan Papavian wrote that the earliest known depiction of the master of animals appears on a stamp seals of the Ubaid period in Mesopotamia. The motif appears on terracotta stamp seals from Tel Allah, ancient Gersu. A cave painting called The Sorcerer found in France depicts an ithophallic half human half stag male. This work is dated approximately from 13,000 BCE. When we travel to Egypt, we find another de deity depicted with horns. Hathor, the horned goddess of pleasure, dance, the arts, fertility, women, love, and the sky, who was closely connected to the sun god, said to be his wife, mother, and daughter, as well as being the central figure of a cult in Upper, upper Egypt where she was worshipped alongside Horus. Hathor is the essence of rebirth inspiration and rejuvenation. Or as scholar Geraldine Pinch writes, Hathor was the golden goddess who helped women to give birth, the dead to be reborn, and the cosmos to be renewed. This complex deity could function as the mother, consort, and daughter of the creator god. Many lesser goddesses came to be regarded as names of Hathor, in her contrasting benevolent and destructive aspects. She was most commonly shown as a beautiful woman wearing a red solar disc between a pair of cow's horns. She is light herself, and she is not the only female deity found with horns when perusing past pantheons. Britain's mythology shares stories of a goddess with antlers, Ellen of the Ways who protects pathways of all sorts, whether they be mental, physical, or spiritual. If you go on any sort of journey, this is the goddess you want by your side. She is elusive and can very well be the consort of the horned god, or could actually be the horned god in and of herself. For she not only protects travelers, but is associated with deer, ley lines, sacred groves, forests, and waterfalls. She is the deity of the between places, with a supernatural foot in both our realm and the realm beyond. Her name quite literally means light. She is seen in some beliefs as the female counterpart of the green man and is known across multiple pantheons. 
this mysterious horned goddess is both of and beyond the land. The land is she and she is the land, which would certainly connect her inextricably with Mother Earth, making her naturally the goddess of ley lines. In Norse beliefs, she is the weaver of the web of weird, fate and destiny spun for the life of each mortal being. The Norse pantheon has at least one other deity with horns, prayer, the horned god of fertility. In Germanic writings, he is known as the god of prosperity, well-being, fertility, and success. Associated with both the boar and the foldable, foldable vessel, Skidlednir. In fact, his golden boar, Gulen Bursti is representative of daybreak itself. He is also known to be the king of the elves. Some even say that the English and Swedish are descendant from him. As Snorri Sturson describes Freyr in his prose Edda, Freyr is the most renowned of the Aesir. He rules over the rain and the shining of the sun, and there with all the fruit of the earth, and it is good to call upon him for fruitful seasons and peace. He also governs prosperity of men. He is said to be the ruler of one of the nine worlds, El Femir in Norse mythology, promoting joy, peace, and fun. He is essentially correlated by modern pagans as the epitome of festivity and undoubtedly known as the god of virility, sex, and vitality. Many other male gods throughout civilizations are known for their sexual prowess, though not all have horns, horns associated with our subject. The Grecian pantheon has a deity who is an excellent example. Pan is depicted as having the legs, hindquarters, and horns of a goat. He he's the companion of the nymphs and the god of nature, mountainous wilds, fields, woodlands, groves, flocks, and shepherds. Pan is often affiliated with both sex and linked to the season of spring specifically. It is interesting to note that sometimes Pan was depicted as a female in art. And as is clear thus far, Pan is one of many possible incarnations of a male deity that a modern pagan can choose from. For each practitioner can choose from so very many when touring the many pantheons avail available from ancient brethren. However, it is important to note that by far the most common revered for modern pagans concerns, concerning the Horned One is Serenade. This member of the Gaulish Celtic mythos wore a torque and antlers and was sometimes accompanied by a serpent or stag. Or serpent and stag. Many believe his power is derived from the triple goddess herself. He is certainly the consort of the goddess, rising in the portion of the wheel of the year associated with Yule, when he is known as the oak or holly king. He is seen as sacrificing his existence each year to ensure that the earth is again fertile. As the year progresses, he grows older, then dies, and then is reborn, dying during autumn or winter months. The wheel turns round and the cycle repeats. He is the guardian of the portal between this world and the realm of the dead. Both life and death itself are a part of his being. Essentially, he has a hoof in both realms. And it is quite clear from every depiction that he is the god of the wild places, known as a gentle guide when traveling between worlds. However, he is not an unwavering being or an unvarying being. As is true in all religious and spiritual belief systems, as society changes, changes our practices change. Today's Horned One is a being of consent and acceptance. Undoubtedly powerful, but simultaneously a gentle deity derived from and even supernaturally beyond our Mother Earth. He is an important guide, 
yet also wants us to find joy and pleasure in daily rites. Many practitioners provide offerings to the god and the goddess, or the god or the goddess. Offerings can be a variety of things or actions themselves. It depends entirely upon the practitioner. Song, dance, poetry, drink, or food, dealer's choice as a, the offering must be chosen by each individual. Some modern pagans also create an altar to the horned one to honor him, covering the sacred space with symbols, leaves, moss, moss or fresh clean soil. Additional possible offerings include, though are not limited to, milk, wine, and blessed water. All are meant to honor this deity. And as is clear by now, pagans in modernity, both in covens and as solitary practitioners, can reference multitude of deities, only some of which I have mentioned this morning. Which god or goddess a practitioner connects with, if choosing to do so at all, is an entirely individual experience. However, no matter the personal choice of an individual practitioner, what becomes clear, crystal clear is that throughout time, different civilizations have had and honored foreign deities. And these gods and goddesses were not negative beings, but rather simply woven into a larger belief system. In fact, negative depictions of horned deities are a modern construct, often part of perceptual belief systems based solely on fear. On a more personal note, I have often wondered if it is entirely possible that each of these deities, as well as numerous other deities, are one and the same. A primordial being who was and is of the earth herself, born with the earth and inextricably linked with her. As centuries have gone by, different human societies experienced the connection with this divine being and created a reference in their own mythos. This would in no way take away from the power held by each of these amazing gods and goddesses, but rather point out the difference between a human being and a deity. We are but mere specks in the array of years that have gone by on Mother Earth. A speck would need to filter the immensity of a deity through what they can perceive as possible. As such, the Horned One takes on many different incarnations throughout the centuries. Depending upon the different incarnations or the belief system, the civilization and the time period. No matter the belief concerning deities, one thing is certain. The Horned One has been here for a very long time weaving his way throughout different civilizations' pantheons, where more often than not, he was not an evil being, but simply deeply connected to the land and the cyclical nature within and of our planet. It is my sincere hope that today's service lifted a veil on this deity, for in my humble opinion, that is the very essence of Unitarian Universalism, or to adapt a bit of our principles and sources, this is where we are led to encourage spiritual growth through a search for truth and meaning available from the wisdom of the world's religions and or spiritual te teachings concerning in part the sacred circle of life. I am most honored to have been able to share this time with you this morning and it is my sincerest hope that we will all go forth from the sp sacred space shining a light through knowledge and of love on all we meet. Have an amazing day, my beautiful mosaic and brothers and sisters, and blessed be.